Back in 1988, at the age of 25, I went to Madison Square Garden to hear The Grateful Dead for the first time. I went at the behest of jazz pianist and musical innovator Cecil Taylor. And when we got there, Ornette Coleman was there. Yes, it's all true, folks. Cecil Taylor, Ornette Coleman, The Grateful Dead and me. Not such an unlikely story, but it's one that we're going to have today on the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. I'm Greg Bendian. Just want to uh, start by saying thank you to everybody for all the great feedback we've been getting. Really appreciate your enthusiasm for this kind of musical discourse. We've been doing it now since August, and it's really going strong. We're having all, a, a, an amazing diversity of people come and talk to us about the inner workings of their musical minds. And... Uh, I also thank everybody for the warm response to me telling stories from my past that I think are fun and, and have some, some historical connection to the continuum of music, creative music. And today's uh, is no exception to that. And I, I, I do appreciate people requesting this story. And when I started working on it, it uh, to, to really put it together to talk to you all about it, it came together really nicely in a way that means that I'll have not just a witness, but an instigator to this incident to talk to today. And many of you will know him as a, as a Grateful Dead devotee and a person who's worked with the organization for a really long time and had uh, a radio show with Phil Lesh called Eyes of Chaos, Veil vale of Ardor on KPFA. He also has a serious satellite radio show called Tales of the Golden Road, and he is the uh, founder and editor of the Grateful Dead Almanac. So I'm very happy to welcome bassist and guitarist Gary Lambert. How you doing, Gary? Hey, Greg. It's great to see you. Great to hear you. It's been a long time. Has been a while. But we go back a ways, and uh, that's to say that we've sort of both been around the, the New York scene for 30-plus years, right? Yeah, well, I grew up here. Then I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for 30 years, which I now call a nice visit because I returned to New York uh, around 2004 and have been back more or less permanently ever since. But uh, the... New York scene of the late 60s, early 70s had a profound influence on me. It's where I first encountered people like Ornette and Cecil and Pharaoh Sanders and many others who had a, an enormous impact on my musical consciousness. And uh, the Grateful Dead were part of that from 1968, 30 years uh, before uh, you encountered them at, at the Garden. Uh, or is it 20? Yeah. 20 years. 20, me, 20 yeah. yeah. Don't want don't to age. That's right. Years. 20. It was that. Now, I meant to ask you, um, well, we'll get to that later, but I'm curious about the the, um, the timeline on the, the series of shows that we're talking about yeah. from September of 88, but we'll get back, get, get back. Actually, to 87. Percent. We're talking about fall of 87. Let me jump in and tell a little bit of background how, how my end of this comes together. Um, I, you know, obviously uh, as a, a jazz drummer uh, and looking into the avant-garde, I got very interested in, in the avant-garde jazz music of so many of the great guys like Ornette and, and Cecil Taylor, um, studied Cecil's music, studied with his drummers, Andrew Cyril and Steve McCall. And that led me to be able to, to connect with Cecil uh, musically. Uh, he came to a gig that we did at the Knitting Factory with my band and uh, eventually um, we started hanging out. So in 87 is, is when this started, because I remember we were playing at the original knitting factory and he came down there. I've seen you there perform, I think with Henry Kaiser and other people. And 
so we we start hanging out like he would call me to go to see the kabuki or he'd call me to go i remember one time he called me uh hey bendy and do you want to go see the new vim vendors wings of desire and we saw that at, at lincoln center and that was a great hang um i remember he got mad at me for fidgeting during the movie <laughs> he said fidget much at the movies <laughs> But, you know, he put up with me. I, I tagged along. Um, we would go to the Vanguard everywhere he went, you know, that he was just he was treated like a king of the music. That was great to see the respect that, you know, the door guy at the Vanguard or um, Sweet Basil. You know, we just walk into these places and, and hang and listen to the stuff. And he could go real long hangs, you know, and luckily I was in my early 20s still so I could make the hang. So he would call me for things. We would, you know, go to uh, to hang out in the village and just talk to to his friends. He had a lot of artist friends in the village. So it was a really incredible experience to, to experience a New York artist like that and, and be able to just see what it, what it was all about. And then I started uh, trying to to get him to hire me. Um, and, he, you know, he had heard my stuff. He heard, he heard my stuff with Derek Bailey, which is, I think, what did the trick. But one of the, th the hangs that he called me for, Gary Lambert, was a four o'clock afternoon call. I believe that's, that's accurate. And he said, first thing he said to me was, Bendian, what are you doing tonight? I said, I'm not doing anything. He said, do you want to go to Madison Square Garden with me to see the Grateful Dead? They've invited me. And he was he was really like, he was jazzed about it. You know, it was neat. It was like I could tell also that he knew I'd appreciate this. Right. So he didn't just call one of his older friends. He's like, oh, I'll, I'll take this guy. I'm going to blow his mind, you know. And that was really beautiful and generous. Um, and so he said, yeah, they you know, they want us to come down. They want, you know, they want to meet me. I said, that's great. So let's do that. At what time? And I think it was something like, like six o'clock, go to the, to this entrance at the, the garden that I've never been to before. And we went down, it was like sort of down this ramp area. Does that sound right? And then um, we went right backstage. And I, I'll, I, I think I'll pause there for a second. And Gary, why don't you please set up sort of, I know your, your relationship with the dead predates this, but give us some of that and maybe, you know, tell us about how this whole thing started. Well, my relationship with the dead as a fan predated it by many years. Um, and then my primary entree into their inner circle um, during the 1980s took place uh, because I was working for the great rock impresario Bill Graham in San Francisco. I know. And so that increased my contact with the dead. I had some previous contact. Uh, I'd interviewed Bob Weir during a, a fitful career of mine as a music journalist in the, uh, in the seventies. Um, but once I was working for BGP, I would come into contact with the dead more often um, and specifically, I was working for a little unit within Bill Graham Presents that was invested in promoting all the stuff that wasn't really mainstream rock, um, primarily on the club level, occasionally larger concerts. But um, I was part of this team that promoted jazz and reggae and African and blues and r and oh, I'd love to hear a little bit about that, Gary. Yeah, well, uh, you know, Bill Graham was a great champion of all that music, you know, uh, yeah, and his company, you know, often had to buy into the conventional wisdom of the music business and present stuff that was considered commercially viable. But Bill always wanted to have a component that was advocating for that kind of music. Of course, if you look at the old Fillmore posters, or you... I do. <laughs> or, or, or you absorb the folklore of the Fillmore and Fillmore East, you'd have these amazing bills where Ross on Roland Kirk would be playing with Santana. I um, look at those all the time because I just say, look at that, you know, and it became such a prototype for places like the bottom line. Right, right. And, uh, you know, 
one one of the completely mind altering shows I saw at Fillmore East was Laura Nero at the peak of her powers, um, you know, just on solo piano. Her, and her classes were like these devotional events. Opening for her were Miles Davis and the Bitches Brew Band <laughs> with both Keith Jarrett and Chick Corea on keys, Jack DeJanette on drums, um, Dave Holland on bass, Ayrto on percussion. I have the box set here. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, B- Bill, Bill's ethos, as, as in his own words, was don't give the public what they want, give them what they should want. And he also used to say about the kids who came to rock shows, he said, they've got to eat their broccoli before they get their ice cream. So that's, that was <laughs> that was that was his notion of, of putting these amazing artists, you know, and not just jazz art, blues, R&B. You know, you'd see Buddy Guy and Junior Wells opening for Jefferson Airplane. You'd see uh, actually there was a bill with with B.B. King headlining and Pharaoh Sanders second, you know, just incredible, incredible juxtapositions, you know, to turn people on to music that would not otherwise be available to them. And wasn't there also a, a Laura Nero crazy horse? No, it was it was Miles with crazy horse. Miles, <laughs> the, the the bill the bill was Miles, then Steve Miller, then Neil Young and Crazy Horse. And Miles didn't care for Steve Miller, so he deliberately showed up late, so he would go on after Steve Miller, which Bill Graham was none too happy with. Although he probably thought, yeah, it's probably artistically the right thing. <laughs> but anyway, so you know, in that atmosphere, you know, I. I grew up and and became. You know, I w- always was a person of very eclectic taste, and Bill only enhanced that with what with what he made a bit available musically. So when I was working for Bill, by the '80s, you know, that was more rare. You know, Bill didn't have as much leeway to do those kinds of shows with those eclectic bills because billings were being dictated by booking agents they say okay if you want the who you've got to have this other act that we book to open for them you know and that was in part reason the bill that bill closed the film more east you know he no longer had that latitude to to do those things so he became somewhat more of a conventional rock promoter but he was also absolutely the best at it and whenever he had the opportunity he would still do you know shortly before i started working for bill i remember there was you know a run of shows at the uh Warfield Theater in San Francisco, you know, by, uh, I think the Dead played a run of shows. And then a few weeks after that, he had Twyla Tharp's Dance Company yeah. for a week. You know, that that's what... Well, what, he was a theater guy, right? He originally came out of theater. He wanted to be an actor. He was a frustrated actor. Right. Came into producing rock shows by, by way of being the business manager of the San Francisco Mime Troupe, which if people think of Mime as the guys with white face, you know, doing annoying, you know pushing the invisible wall kind of stuff. San Francisco Mime Troop was in fact sort of a guerrilla political theater company. Street stuff, right? In the parks. In they the would park. get busted for performing in the parks without permits. So Bill Graham's very first concert that he promoted was a benefit for the San Francisco Mime Troop to bail them out because they, they'd been busted. And then he started doing shows at the Fillmore. And in fact, John Handy was on one of his very first shows along with the former Warlocks, the Grateful Dead had just changed their name to the Grateful Dead. So... You know, that was always part of Bill's mission was to turn people on to stuff that was not normally commercially available. And after I'd started working for him, you know, it, people there found out that I was very conversant in all these different kinds of music. So, so I got to be part of this little team that promoted all the stuff that fell between the cracks, all the stuff that was thought to be non-commercial. And in my first year of doing that in 1980, I, I started there in 83, in 84, promoted a couple of shows by Ornette Coleman and Primetime. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, at our club called Wolfgang's, which was about a, I guess in seated capacity was about 600. It could also have a dance floor for rock and also a place with an incredibly eclectic booking policy. We'd have the Beastie Boys and then later that week we'd have the Art Ensemble of Chicago and then we'd have, you know, John Hyatt and Rye Cooter. It was, it was a fantastic, fantastic club. So, um, so I'd been a fan of Ornette's for many years. I first seen him in 1972 at Artist House, his own loft. Oh, you saw Artist House? Yeah. That's cool. Um, completely, you know, mind-blowing experience, of course. Do you, do you remember the, the Artist House gig? Yeah, very well. Uh, it, it was, it was, um, Ornette, Eddie Blackwell, Charlie Hayden, and Dewey Redman. Uh, Don, Don Cherry was in the band at that point, but he wasn't there that night. Uh, and they did two, two sets 
but they were considered two discrete shows. Like I, I think they were, you know, you could stay for the second show, but they played exactly the same set list, both shows. And I was utterly gratified for that because it took me the second show to absorb you know what I heard. That's, in the that's first. a great experience. That's a great yeah. way to do it. Do yeah. it two, two times right up front. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like going to the going to see the same symphony twice or anything like that. You just you become acquainted with the structure. So that was that was fantastic. So I've been a fan of Ornette's for you know already more than a decade when I first promoted this show with Primetime, uh, and got to meet Ornette and Donardo, and we hit it off immediately. Um. Then Ornette and I found out we had the same birthday, March 9th. Uh, so that, you know, that that became a part of our relationship. And then they came back, I think, the next year or a year after that. We, we had them a second time. Uh, so Now let's just, let's just jump in for a yeah. second. That's the, which lineup of prime time, please? Uh, well, Jamal Adeen, um, Al McDowell, Bern Nix, um, of course, Donardo. Uh, this was before... He got Dave Bryan on keyboards. It was a keyboardless version. I, I'm I'm not yeah. remembering everybody. Would it be two guitars though? Would it be Charlie Ellerby as well? Yeah, yeah. Charlie Ellerby was was in that lineup. Yeah, yeah. So so Burn, Charlie, uh, Jamal Adeen. Um and uh, then that, that I think pretty much that lineup came back. Uh, maybe Jamal Adeen was gone by that point. I really I you know can't recall for sure. But so by the time by by the time 1987 rolled around, I already had this deepening relationship with Ornette and Donardo. And and it was in 1987 that uh, Phil Lesh and I hooked up and started doing this radio show. Now, uh, that came about by a pretty interesting happenstance. Um, I had helped KPFA in Berkeley uh, with their fundraising activities. And one of their fundraising activities in 1986 uh, the Grateful Dead, who were great supporters of Pacific Radio and, and KPFA, uh, allowed uh, KPFA to broadcast one of their shows from the Greek Theater in Berkeley. And that was the centerpiece of a day-long fundraising marathon, which at the time shattered all fundraising records, you know, and brought all these deadheads into the KPFA tent, which oh. was a fantastic thing. So later that year, the Dead then... Uh, gave their blessing to KPFA Broadcasting in their New Year's Eve show from the Henry J. Kaiser uh, Convention Center in Oakland. And um, I was going to host that and help produce it. So for that particular broadcast, we were talking, the production team was talking about, what are we going to do during intermission? You know, the intermissions of these things are always, you know, uh, a lot of dead air because you never know how long the the break the band is going to take. It's kind of dictated by when midnight rolls around on New Year's Eve, you know, so they, there was going to be about 45 minutes of, of, of time that needed filling. And they said, well, why don't we take a remote mic out in the crowd and interview deadheads? And I sort of said, that's, you know, that's kind of a crapshoot. <laughs> you don't know how articulate people are going to be. It could be really chaotic, you know. Uh, and then I said, why don't we let the Grateful Dead be guest DJs for this break? Why don't we, I, I didn't mean actually sitting at turntables and picking out records, but in advance of the gig, I said, why don't we ask the members of the Grateful Dead to pick out one or two pieces of music they would like played during the intermission? And exactly as I hoped, they came up with this extraordinarily eclectic list. I think Bob Weir said he wanted Otis Redding's Try a Little Tenderness and a collaboration by Duke Ellington and Frank Sinatra from a record they made in the 60s. Yeah. Uh, um, on the tune Poor Butterfly. Uh, uh, Mickey Hart, of course, picked something from you know, Papua New Guinea or something like that, uh, you know, endangered music from a rainforest. Um, Bill Kreisman said anything by Coltrane with Elvin Jones on it. Um, and uh, Jerry Garcia, I think, deliberately tried to trip me up because he went really obscure. He said, I, I want to, there's a 16th century uh, Italian Renaissance Christmas carol. <laughs> And and there's a song by the Fairfield Four of Richmond, Virginia, called "All Things Are Possible," and I found both of them, so uh, wow. so I was I was happy with that. And then Phil Lesh said, "Well, the thing I'd really like you to play on the radio is an hour long symphony by this dead British guy named Havergal Brian. So you can't do it because it's too long. It would take up the whole break and more. So mm -hmm. so I sort of put that notion in my back pocket. We came up with a great 
amount of music for the break anyway. There was plenty, plenty to fill the time. And then just after that New Year's Eve, I got in touch with Phil and I said, hey, you know, I'm sure if you ever wanted to come on KPFA and play that in a freestanding space, play that Havergal Bryant symphony, you know, we could arrange it. And now Phil was sort of the dead's emissary to the avant-garde in a lot of ways. You know, he, uh, they had this philanthropic organization that some of your listeners might know about uh, called the Rex Foundation, which has been raising millions and millions of dollars for all kinds of worthy causes for going on 40 years now. Um, you know, environmental causes, educational causes, uh, all kinds of social justice stuff. Um, and they've supported a lot of people in the arts. And Phil's specialty was kind of arranging for grants or, you know, bringing greater attention to composers and improvisers of adventurous, you know, not, music considered not at all commercially viable. Uh, and they had given some grants to composers in England, including the foundation. Uh, Havergal Bryan was deceased, but there was a foundation overseeing his music. Uh, they helped underwrite recordings by um, composers like Chris Dench, Michael Finnessy, um, uh, Harrison Burt Whistle was a favorite of Phil's. Um, so, you know, that was kind of his thing. So I invited him to come on KPFA and play some Havergal Bryan. And to my astonishment, he came back and said, well, why just do that once? Why not make a regular radio show out of it? Oh, I see. Because Phil had deep roots at KPFA. He had been a volunteer at KPFA in 1962. You know, that some of his first interactions with Jerry Garcia took place there. So he had great affection for the channel. And uh, I said, yeah, let's make a radio show out of it. And we got a monthly slot. We started in June of 1987. And our mission was playing all kinds of music, you know, really without stylistic boundaries, except it had to be, you know, the weirder, the better, the more transgressive, the better, the, mm -hmm. the fewer outlets it had to be played elsewhere, the better. So it, it was really, we'd been doing this show for a few months as of September of 1987. And the dead were coming to play Madison Square Garden. This was, mind you, just after they'd had this incredible career breakthrough with a top 10 album and a hit single after years of, you know, not being considered at all mainstream. Yeah, the hit single was... Uh, Touch of Grey. Touch of Grey. The album was In the Dark, both of which went top 10. You know, unheard of in Grateful Dead history. Nothing yeah, it else. is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so their audience had grown enormously, so they could sell out multiple nights at Madison Square Garden. I, th I think, I think that the year, this particular year, '87, I think they did six or eight nights. I can't remember. But yeah, were they consecutive nights? Do you remember around when they, they were? They would usually. It, it was September of '87. Uh, I think. I think the night that you guys came out had been September twentieth, um, but. Uh -huh. You know, they, they usually if they were doing a long run, there would be like a uh, like maybe three nights, a break, three more nights or whatever. Um, but yeah, they they you know and they could, they sold it out effortlessly at that point. Um, the following year, I think they played nine nights at the Garden, and they were also selling out stadiums, outdoor you know places. So they had this enormous popularity, but they still always were intent on turning their audience onto new stuff. A couple of years before. Uh, they'd had Baba Ola Tunji and his Drums of Passion open for them on New Year's Eve, which was, you know, just absolutely transcendent. And they would bring in people like Hamza Eldeen and Ayerto and Flora. And, you know, just, you know, that was through Mickey Hart's connection to the world music community. So they were always about, you know, trying to turn on their audience to, to new stuff. And in 87, Phil and I had this new outlet for doing that. So I just kind of idly said to him, you know, Phil, you know, we've got this radio show. We're, we're reaching out to the new music community. We had been to the Knitting Factory together, I think maybe during that 87 run. I think we went to see Anthony Braxton together. Um, Knitting Factory pretty recently opened at that point. I think. Right. That, it was new when, when yeah. we were playing there. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I said to Phil, you know, Ornette lives two blocks from the garden. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if we invited him and Zanardo to come to a show? And Phil said, oh, yeah, let's do that. And so, so we did that from our end. Uh, and Dan Healy, the dead sound man, you'll, you'll probably remember like set up seats, you know, right at the soundboard 
Yes, we sat at the soundboard. Yeah, so you could have absolutely the sweetest spot, you know, in, in the place for sound. And, you know, but you were also kind of like, you had privacy, you know, it was like. And, was, and I think they were raised seats. So yeah, there, there was a little, bit of, a little bit of a riser. Yeah. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was, it was a real nice setup. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I made the arrangements with Lornette and Donardo. They, they were delighted to, to take me up on it. And then I get, I come out to the seats and I see Cecil, you know, and, and with you. And uh, I had no idea that was happening. That was a complete surprise to I me. I had no idea? No. I later found out, uh, if I have it right, that this was arranged. There was a mutual friend of Cecil's and the band within the Grateful Dead organization. And this this woman has an incredible backstory. There, there was a woman uh, named Calico. She was known as Calico. Uh to, to, to the deadhead world. She was a member of the hog farm commune with Wavy Gravy. She okay. had been at Woodstock with, with the hog farm. She traveled the world with the hog farm. Um, and she was sort of this like hippie den mother, you know, these long gray pigtails and the sort of peasant dress. And... Wait a minute. Trudy? No, her name, her, her, her real name was Elizabeth. Okay. Uh, but, uh, I had no idea that she had any connection to Cecil or anyone like that. What I found out sometime later was that Calico was, in fact, a woman named Elizabeth van der Meij. She was from the Netherlands. And in the 50s and early 60s, she had come to the States, had been a jazz journalist and, and did jazz radio and was old friends with Cecil. She knew Ornette as well. And she had lived with Eric Dolphy. You know, and <laughs> nothing prepared that I knew about this wonderful, sweet, hippie woman prepared me for this knowledge. But she was apparently the driving force between getting Cecil to the show. And you know, the planets lined up to the point that the invitation to Ornette and Cecil were, were for the same night. And, yeah. and there we all were together. <laughs> so just well, imagine. That's funny that you say you were surprised because we didn't know Ornette was going to be there. Right, right. So my shock was when we go backstage, picking up wh where I left off, literally was at that point we're going backstage for the first time because we went back during intermission. Right. But I remember we walked in, we saw you, you met us, right? Yeah. Um, and then you were surprised to see Cecil or you saw Cecil earlier? No, I think that was my first okay. sighting of Cecil as and well. Then you said, and you said, come on, guys. And we went back into this beautifully decorated space that I think was Phil Lesh's area. Right. I think that was at halftime. That was not before the show. I think I think that's when I brought you back at halftime because that's where the actual meetings took place. With okay. The, with the band. Yeah. So what did we do before halftime? The first time. You know, I'm not. I I remember meeting Ornette and Donardo, and then I I think I just maybe just met you guys out of the seats. Maybe someone directed you there other than me, but. Um, but I, I, I definitely remember being surprised. Whenever it was, I was surprised to see Cecil and delighted. Um, and then, you know, the first set took place. And, yeah, the first set of a dead show is always kind of the band sort of getting the feel of the room and warming up. And, you know, they play – it's more songs-oriented rather than well, – Well, yeah, so, and I'd love to, to tell you about my experience on that, but go ahead. Yeah. Uh, of course, on this night – I barely watched the band. I watched those guys watching the band, you know, it was like, I kept, I kept looking at Ornette and Cecil and, you know, just the difference in their demeanor as people anyway, you know, was, was, uh, was one level, but, uh, Ornette always just had this sort of like inscrutable smile on his face, you know, and he was just taking it in and, you know, and absorbing it. And Cecil's a little more animated. Like I see Cecil's head was moving to it, you know, and, uh, um, I was really, yeah. I I didn't discuss in any depth what their take on the music was, but I just watched them, you know. So you got to watch that from that from a different angle. Yeah. That yeah, it, it was um. It was as you re you recall, it was songs, and I know that it, they sounded really good. I yeah. you know I I guess they were aware that the guys were there, um, but that would become more evident later. Right. I'll get to that in a second, but I remember that after the the song set, which was great, Jerry sounded great, played great solos. You know, it was really, it was really cool. 
uh, we went backstage and when Phil came in to, to meet us, Cecil like enthusiastically said, well, we sure heard some American music tonight. Right. You remember that? Right. right. F that may have followed what I think was the first thing. Cause I, I, I actually got, I mean, getting to make these introductions, you know, right. in, in my, it was like saying, Ornette Coleman, Jerry Garcia, Jerry Garcia, Ornette Coleman. Like hearing those words come out of my own mouth was just, you know, yeah. you know William Shakespeare, Aristotle, Aristotle, <laughs> William Shakespeare. You know, it, was, it was one of those dream, you know, people always do the, uh, the hypothetical, your dream dinner, you know, I was living my dream dinner. And when I took, I took Cecil over to Phil, and I, the first thing I recall Cecil saying to Phil was, man, who does your lighting? Oh yeah, he did. Nice. And and I think Phil went and got Candace, who was the lighting director, and and, and they met, because Cecil was always so interested with the visual, you know, and 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 you know, he he was so into the interdisciplinary thing of and of, also of, just and production. Yeah, the whole experience, yeah. and I think maybe it's not a coincidence. The next time I saw Cecil, he played solo at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, and the lighting was like. There was something a little dead like about the lighting, you know, in, in a subtle way, which is not, which, you know, people, if you think of Grateful Dead lighting, you might think of like people being blasted with psychedelic light shows. So it wasn't like that. Their no, lighting no. direct, their lighting was very subtle and very nuanced, you know, and, and, I and that. yeah, it looks, yeah. it looked like a good show. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so yeah. So Cecil asked about the lighting first and then that, the American music quote was, was beautiful too. Um, and, and yeah, Phil delighted in that. You know, I think yeah. everybody had a really wow. You know, it was it was very nice. Yeah, yeah. And then you know the uh, the the set the 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 hang at the break. You know, by necessity, kind of brief because you know it's like what half an hour or whatever. You know, and everyone wants to meet everybody. So, um, but it was really incredible to see those little moments of interaction, and then going back out for the second set. And of course, in the second set is when things open up a little more. Well, this is what I remember. Yeah. So, uh, a couple of interesting moments were Phil came up to me and he said, Greg, I heard that you were uh, just in London with Derek Bailey. And I, did you tell him that? No, maybe Cecil did in the course of their conversation. Um, I don't know, but it was really funny because, uh, I knew that Phil was into all the deepest shit, you know, like yeah. I knew his reputation. I knew he had studied with Barrio. I knew that he had, you know, gotten seriously uh, into his musicality on a multiple classical level. And, and that right. I always really appreciated and respected that about him. So for, for him to say, I know who Derek Bailey is and I care that you played with him yeah. was, was, was a really great moment for me. And we talked about that and, and uh, and then we talked about Barrio and, and some other stuff. I remember I wanted to to hit him up because I was also a big fan of Barrio. You know who was a big fan of Barrio uh, is John McLaughlin. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, uh, and so there's so many great works. You know the vocal stuff and the sequenzas and and there's just so much music. Um, but yeah, so I got a chance to chat with him about that. It's great. And then I remember, if you remember this, Phil says to Ornette. So you're from Texas, and and can we talk about the blues? Do you remember this? Yes, and yes. Or, yes. Ornette, I I don't remember much of what came after that, but I remember that Ornette said to everybody, the only white man that could ever sing the blues was Captain Beefheart. Ha! I I missed that. I know I would have dug that when I heard it. it oh was man! Not, you know, and I was I thought, oh man, this is it's all coming together. You know, yeah, like well, yeah. Ornette knows Beefheart stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Ornette, Ornette and Beefheart have spent some time. Interestingly, a, a guy who's a very Beefheart friend. certainly knew the Ornette stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a, a, a very, one of the guys now coming back to my work for Bill Graham Presents, one of the guys who was part of that little team that, that produced all the outside music for Bill Graham um, previously had been Beefheart's manager during the, uh, it went during uh, Beefheart's San Francisco period, time of bat chain puller and all that. Oh yeah. 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 So uh so yeah, so Ornette and Beefheart have definitely spent time together. That's that's funny though. Um, yeah, you know that that to me is always one of the great, you know, untold stories of the Grateful Dead was their the depth and breadth of their musical scholarship, and and you know, beyond scholarship, just passion for all kinds of 
you know, really, really uh, groundbreaking outsider music. You know, um, it, it's reflected, you know, on their album Anthem of the Sun. There they were like, you know, borrowing from Henry Cowell and uh, and uh, John Cage. There's prepared piano on that album. That's their second album. You know, oh, 1967, 68. And, uh, you know, they, uh, Phil turned all those guys on. You know, they were like rock musicians and bluegrass musicians and R&B musicians. And when he came into that little communal setting, like <laughs> he would give them psychedelics and sit them down and play them Charles Ives' Fourth Symphony, you know, which was a major work in my life as well as his. You Have know. you ever seen it performed live? Not only have I seen it performed, I first saw it performed live in 1976 uh, by Seiji Ozawa and the Boston Symphony. Um, my brother was at the world premiere, you know, because it wasn't, it didn't premiere till like 11 years after Ives died. Right. Uh, Stokowski and the American Symphony Orchestra played at the Carnegie Hall. My brother got to go to that. So I got turned on to the, the world premiere recording of that about a year later. So I was getting turned on to the Beatles and Charles Ives at the same time. Great. You know? This is like 1964, 65. And I always ha have a feeling that had a huge influence on how warped my musical mind is. Those influences, you know, coming at the same time, you know, were, were really, really uh, formative for me. So well, Because you so, didn't know there was anything other than that. That was just the right. world for you, right? Right. It, it, just, it, it, just, it just kicked every door open, you know. And uh, so... Yes, yeah, so in, in answer to your question, I, I saw the Ives Fourth in 1976. But one of my greatest and most insane immersions in any piece of music ever was in the early 2000s. Maybe it was 2001 or thereabouts. The San Francisco Symphony under Michael Tilson Thomas played the Ives Fourth four times in one week, and I went every time. And I always say that, first of all. It, it was equally or more mind blowing with each accelerating time, but it also, it taught me lessons about improvising with your ears, you know, like listening for different things and changing. And it's your spatialized. Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, where you're sitting in the hall makes it a different piece. Mm -hmm. um, how engaged each section of the orchestra is, you know, like uh, how engaged the audience is really, because, you know, with, with music like Ives, you'll, you'll occasionally get the, restless symphony subscriber vibe out of an audience you know like okay. like they, they they subscribe to the season to hear the greatest hits to hear beethoven and, and the gang you know and then if they're subjected to ives some of them are going to get it and others are going to be very restless and you know you'll hear the rustling of programs so seeing ives ives fourth four times in a row was was as it was like seeing those two ornette sets in one night that were the same piece you know oh man i'm so jealous <laughs> i only got to see it once at the new york phil yeah and I was sitting next to a tourist who had just picked up a cheap, cheap ticket. Right. And I was there to have a religious experience. Yeah. So, uh, and I do, I, and when I listen to it at home, that's one thing, but here, you know, I was going to hear Watchmen tell us of the night yes. and I just burst into tears and it just was so heavy to me that, uh, you know, the, the second movement, then takes, you know, goes into quarter tone stuff and yeah, yeah. just, you know, all the, the piano stuff and all the different sub ensembles. And you're right. It's so much to listen to that. You're like improvising how you're looking at relationships between the different groupings and things. Yeah. And, and, and it's three dimensional now because it's, you know, you're there and it's, it's right hitting you in real time. That's the difference between the recording and the, and the live experience right sure. there. Yeah. Wow. So, so all that stuff, you know, like I, it's funny. I, I, there were times before I knew that Phil was into Ives that I perceived the dead's music as Ivesian. There's like this simultaneity of different things going on in their music. And sometimes I've said that sometimes I like their music better when it sounds more like an argument than a conversation <laughs> because, because those guys would try to play everything different every time they played it you know, never replicate the last performance of it. And you'd have differing intentions or differing ideas of where to go next, you know, and, and, you know, th that's something that is always present in Ives' written music, you know, <laughs> he, he wrote it to make it sound like that, to make it sound like, you know, clashing 
clashing rhythms, clashing key signatures, you know, all of that stuff. So I very early on in my in my time as a deadhead, I said, this music really it reminds me of Ives in some ways. And then a few years later, I heard Phil raving about Ives in an interview. And I said, oh, man, you know, <laughs> I felt nicely vindicated by that. Um, so anyway, <laughs> to, to wind I, back I, around. I'll tell you something about the fourth, though. Yeah. In my work at Yale Oral History of American Music, they uh -huh. have all the handwritten Ive scores. Oh, man. Oh, incredible. At the library. Oh, my God. And I went up there on more than one occasion to listen and to study from the pencil of Ives. And, yeah. and the edges of the sheets are decaying. Yeah. And you just, it's just like you can smell the barn it was sitting in. Yeah, right. Oh my, it's just, it blew my mind. And then eventually uh, they transferred his house, uh, his room, his comp music room from his house to a museum at the uh, Arts and Letters yeah. in the upper Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And so um, for the Ives fans out there, you know, you can see his workspace. I've got to do that. Yeah, that's it's a and it's a it's a mind blowing thing because everything there's a Civil War trumpet in there. Yeah. Cornet, you know the the hat that he wore. There's just if you want the full lives experience. Yeah. That's something. So, um, yeah. So back to you, sir. <laughs> well, yeah, we could. The Ives tangent could go on for days. Exactly. On I I won't ask you about your, yeah. your your favorite chamber piece. Yeah, but um. So anyway, um getting us back to 1987 uh, and, and the dead, you know, they, they got into that second set. Um, and well, before we go that, yes. So, so Phil then says, Hey guys, to Cecil and Ornette and, uh, and me and Donardo, he says, hang out for the second set. We're going to play free. Yeah. Yeah. You remember that? And yeah. so, so that was an interesting invitation too, where he's like, we're, we're telling them, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to do our improv thing. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's an interesting thing about the dead in that they always took it free in the second set. But the dead had this determination to, like, play a different set list every night. And it was never a written set list. They discussed it, you know, before they went out. But they they kind of made it up as they went along in some ways. But if they were playing, say, five nights at the garden, they wouldn't they could go five nights without repeating a song because their book was so huge. Um, so occasionally by the end of a run of shows, you know, they might have, and they wouldn't want to repeat what they played any of those other nights. They might exhaust, not exhaust, but limit their improvisational possibilities because they had already played the songs that were most capable of opening up, you know, into free space. And I remember that night at the garden, you know, with Ornette and Cecil there, I said, oh, it's too bad that they played such and such two nights ago because they really could have taken that somewhere. Yeah. And so my, my uh, comprehension of the set list that night was it was not their most adventurous juxtaposition of songs, but they did manage to get, get it, you know, pretty out there and dissolve song structure and get pretty free. Oh so, yeah, it was. Yeah. And the drum feature. I yeah. The drum feature was always, you know, and going to that shamanic place that Mickey and Bill could go with, you know, not just not just the conventional two guys behind kits, but set the drones and the and, and the I remember big... there was panning going yeah. on too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember uh this really amazing moment for me was they were in the middle of this improv and it was swirling and it had a, a lot of different moving parts. Yeah. And I had this perception that the guys on stage were playing for two people in this entire arena. Right. Right. And I, and I sort of looked and I'm like, they're just trying to communicate with Cecil and yeah. Ornette. Yeah. And it was interesting because I knew that that could happen. I knew it was very real. I, you know, having been in that position to play for, for one or two people that you want to be there. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really beautiful moment too. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I did, I thought of that, you know, I didn't articulate the same way as you, but I said, man, they, I knew how, I knew how stoked the dead were to be in the presence of those men, you know, among 20,000 people in Madison Square right. Garden and the whole audience was getting off on what they were doing. But yeah, that, that part of their music that was really not just directed by, but 
directed to, but directed by Cecil and Ornette because they had had such an influence on who, who these guys were, you know, their desire to play free, you know, was in part inspired by those guys. So it, it was, it was a beautiful exchange and, a, you know, almost a, um, a compens an act of compensation, you know, <laughs> like, yes, you know, re repay, repaying a debt. So, um, as I said, you know, like Ornette had kind of a beautiful, you know, positive poker face, uh, just a little smile. And he was very, he was into what was going on around him. He was like, he, he, he felt what the crowd was doing and how the crowd influenced the music, you know, not in that cliche rock and roll way of everyone stomping their feet and clapping, you know, usually on the one and the three rather than the two and the four, but, you know, but, uh, it was, it was that element in the Des music of the crowd being that extra member of the band where, you know, the, the exchange of energy is, is, is really very fluid. Um, and the dead don't pander to very much to like rock concert convention either. So, you know, they would, they would play in odd signatures and they would not do the thing that really was designed to milk applause from an audience so much, you know, they, yeah, they're, they're, they were loose and they were tight, you know, yeah. that that's, that's a jazz aesthetic. I mean, NRBQ, I yeah, think, is absolutely. the same aesthetic. Yeah, very much so. I think we've run into to each other at some Q shows. If you yeah, think. well, I, I, I had the uh, Herculean task of uh, co-managing them for a few years, but that's a whole <laughs> other episode. <laughs> but, uh, but it, it, interestingly, at the end of the show, like I said, I hadn't really, I, Ornette and I had, had exchanged a few comments because we were more into into absorbing the music, but. I can't remember what they finished with. It might have been not fade away, but they came back for the encore and it was Broke Down Palace, which is, you know, almost like a gospel song. You know, it's it's a beautiful hymn like, you know, lament. Uh and that's I saw Ornette tear up. Like that one really hit him. Like, you know, just in, in addition to everything else that was going on in the room, you know, just that very simple sort of churchy thing really, really had an effect on him, you know, and that might have spoken to his Texas roots and being in church as a young man as well, you know, but uh, um, that that really struck me. That, that was a beautiful thing to watch. Yeah, and I, I remember uh, Cecil moving around and uh, and we stood for the second half. Yeah, yes. No, we, no one sits in the second half. Yeah, yeah, and I remember we were standing behind the soundboard, uh, yeah. elevated, yeah. and and Cecil was was checking it out. You know, it's um, it's interesting what you say about Ornette taking in the whole situation. When I interviewed Wayne Shorter for the uh, oral history thing, uh, he we talked about weather report, and he told me that he and Zaunul would go to see bands like Yes and Genesis to check out the production and to check out what was going on. Cause they were looking to make weather, weather report more of a big experience. Right. And I, I was very impressed with that, that he told me that, and that, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, they did, they didn't want to be confined to that, you know, well, you know, Miles said that about his electric music too. You know, My Miles like hated the idea of everyone wearing a suit and facing forward and playing right into a mic. So he got he got the rig where he could prowl the stage and play, you know, and that it changed the music to change the physicality of how the music was presented. Um, uh, and all of them, all of us were co coping with how do you get instrumental music across to an audience? Right. So it's right. part of this whole idea of Cecil. Of course, Cecil's going to be interested in the lights because yeah. he's paying attention to these other musical experiences of that moment. And it's, 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 it's actually really fascinating to think about that because I think people don't realize those guys were full package guys. Yeah. Yes. You know, Ornette's whole thing with how primetime set up and his hand painted suits. Right. It was about engaging all the senses, you know, and, and, uh, and having it be as much about the visceral as the intellectual, you know, and, uh, yeah, you know that that's why their music was so so powerful so and it's funny when i first heard it you know when i first heard the when i first heard free music it didn't seem like an aberration to me at all you know a lot of people take their time getting into it uh maybe it was because of having heard heard ives and the beatles at the same time you know right, that right. that it opened my ears to to those possibilities and maybe a lot of people don't have that opportunity 
yeah, as I was as I was so fortunate to have. Yeah, you know, and and it was also uh, when I was hanging with Cecil, it was a sense of sign of kind of like a, a mentorship that that he was offering. Uh, I, I saw his world, and I, you know, I got a chance to show him that I was, you know, really dedicated to the stuff. Otherwise, he wouldn't. I don't think he would have spent that much time with me. But at the same time, I was I was young, and you know, really doing music. So you know, he was open to going to see every musical situation. Right. That was cool. You know, yeah. he he never had any kind of, oh, I wouldn't check that out. He was totally open, like I say, Kabuki or the Bolshoi or whatever it was. And it was remarkable because uh, that meant that I could be myself with him musically. I didn't have to sort of front that I was like a post Andrew Sorrell guy or Steve McCall, but you know, he knew I had studied with them. Yeah. So he knew I, he, I, what I was going to bring to his music. And so by March of 89, finally, uh, he was playing with Tony Oxley and Tony Oxley uh, couldn't make it for some gigs in the States, whatever happened. And he called me at six in the morning and he, and he didn't even say hello. He just said, we're playing in Cambridge tonight. Are you available? I said, <laughs> it's like six in the morning. He wakes me up, man. I, I have an office gig at this point, right? Uh -huh. I have to be at work at eight. <laughs> and he's like, can you be in, in Cambridge tonight to play with us? Tony Oxley's unavailable. I said, yes. Uh, yes. Um, he said, uh, so-and-so will be in touch with you to give you the information. Click. Wow. Then I had to call in sick. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, you, you know, my life changed after that, you know, your, because, your priorities were right. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to call in sick. Um, yeah. And, and then, then we made the inflorescence record for a m and john snyder produced that record so i wanted to tell you this john snyder story yeah. because the reason that cecil and ornette were icy together to each other that right. night at the garden right which i didn't i mean you didn't expect it so it kind of happened but yeah. I'm, i noticed it you noticed it yeah they're, they're not looking at each other so john snyder who did artist house records with right. ornette he did tales of captain black with with blood you know all the the um the charlie hayden records right remember close was a closeness right and uh soap suds soap suds that, soap suds, soap suds yeah, yeah um body meta right these incredible records john snyder told me that at one point and i want to have john on to talk about this at one point when he was with ornette ornette said i want to do a piano concerto version of skies of america Mm -hmm. So this is an Ornette story for all the Ornette historians. Hopefully you have some of this, but they only got to rehearsal point of this version, which was a piano concerto version of this orchestral piece with Cecil as the soloist. Uh -huh. They meet for rehearsal or, or um, like a musical meet to play and look at material and, and uh, discuss. And Cecil's looking at the material of Ornette and he's playing it the way he wants to play it. Right. And Ornette keeps coming over to him and saying, could you play more triads? Uh, I need you to play more triads. And this gets to the point where, of course, Cecil being Cecil <laughs> and is not going to be told how to play. He gets up, he hands the music to Ornette and he walks out. Oh, man. And that, I think, was the, the time right before, that was the time they had seen each other last. Ah, uh, okay. All right, <laughs> well... I, I know they got past it later in life and I'm happy. Yeah. I'm, ha I, I'm, I'm happy. To, I, I got a wonderful report of the, the last interaction between Ornette and, and Cecil being very, very sweet and very touching. So uh, we can report that uh, <laughs> forgiveness. Well, forgiveness and was also there. you ran into Cecil uh, after that and, and talked about the evening, right? Oh, about, about, we didn't talk so much about Madison square garden, but we, we, uh, we connected every now and then, um, I believe the same person, Calico. God bless her. Uh, she also let Phil and I know that uh, that Cecil was in Oakland rehearsing a large ensemble for a, a piece that had been commissioned by the San Francisco Jazz Festival. Um, and uh, they used the space of the Oakland Jazz Club Yoshis for rehearsals. And so Phil and I dropped by to see Cecil rehearse, and he was, you know, 
he was really happy to see us and we chatted there. Uh, this was already a couple of years after the garden, so uh, we didn't really talk about that subject. The thing that really made Cecil happy was the Grateful Dead's Rex Foundation had an annual award, which was named after the great jazz journalist, uh, producer, et cetera, Ralph J. Gleason. And it was, it was for outstanding accomplishments in the arts. And, uh, they had, uh, you know, given it to all kinds of wonderful people, not just in jazz, uh, occasionally to composers of orchestral music, to, uh, people like Mike Seeger, the great folk musician and, and folklorist, um, and people like that. So, uh, in this particular year, they had given it to Sun Ra. Um, and unfortunately, Sonny died between the time the award was announced and the time that the, 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 the money was awarded. So it got distributed among members of the orchestra. Um, so, and, and Cecil, I said, I said hi to Cecil. And he said, he said, I heard you people did a very good thing. <laughs> and that award had just been announced. And he was very, very thrilled that, 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 that Sonny had been honored like that. Um, and then after I started coming back to New York, first in kind of a bi-coastal way, and then after I moved here, I'd see Cecil all the time at the 55 bar, you know. See, that's my other memory of him. I, the yeah. one the one was uh, we had dinner at, like a couple of years after he had fired me, and I, we sort of made up. Yeah. But I would play at the 55 bar with Mark Egan's trio, and Cecil would always show up. Yeah. And one time he was getting ready to play with Max. And I remember he was sitting at the bar and, and I came over and he said, Bendian, I'm playing with one of your heroes right now. And Max, I, he knew that Max was one of my heroes because Max had been really nice to me when we toured Brazil with Cecil's unit and Max's quartet. Mm -hmm. And I, I just actually talked about that with Fred Frith on the podcast. He was on that tour with Naked City with Zorn. And, uh, and so he says, I've been working with one of your heroes and uh, he's, you should be aware that he, he is, you know, the, the greatest. He's like do, doing a whole Max blow up thing. And I'm going, yeah, this is really cool, you know. But then uh, he just got up and, and walked out mm -hmm. and then he would like come back in and like he was just always on the go, you know. Right. And, and, and so it was funny to, to be playing at the 55 and, and then, yeah, there he is. Yeah. Yeah. He was there a lot. I mean. Um, I, if not a majority of times I went there, enough times that you'd notice, I always kind of sit at the same spot at the end of the bar. One of my musician friends uh, used to say, uh, yeah, Cecil's like the norm of the 55. If you know Norm from Cheers, the TV show <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> he's kind of the norm of the 55. Which would say a lot about the 55 bar. To totally correct. I said, yeah, that, that's more my kind of bar than Cheers was. You know? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, so many memories of 55. Uh, yeah, but if I can, if I can get back, you know, a little bit of the after story of the Please. of the of the Ornette and the Dead encounter, that end of it, um, I don't think it was much more than a week or ten days later that Donardo called me and said, "Hey, Gary, you know, my dad's working on a new album, Primetime, right now, and he's wondering if, it, if do you think Jerry might want to play on it?" And I said, "Uh, yeah." <laughs> It was like one of the great well duh questions of all time. You know? Yeah, like when Cecil said, Do you want to go to see the Grateful Dead with me? Right. Cecil right. Taylor, Grateful Dead. Hmm, yeah. yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I can make that work. Um so, you know, this was the album that turned out to be Virgin Beauty. Um and unfortunately, like Jerry's Jerry was like fully booked for a while, you know, uh with his own band and, you know, other activities with the dead. Uh, and there was a little bit of communication snafu within the like Grateful Dead management hierarchy. I think there were some people who worked with Jerry who didn't really fully appreciate how amazing this was that, you know, that Ornette wanted Jerry to record with him. So there was some heel dragging and stuff, but eventually what happened was Jerry made a separate trip to New York for a couple of days. Um, basically at the very end of the Virgin Beauty sessions, everything else was recorded. So, so he overdubbed for Virgin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't get to interact live. And he he and Ornette always regretted they never got to, you know, do something from scratch, from the ground up, you know, uh, just because of everybody being so busy and having so much going on in their lives. But but Jerry wound up contributing guitar to uh, to to three tracks on that album. Right. You know, and it was it was wonderful. It was just, you know, Jerry's voice really fit in there, you know. Um, 
And then um, some years after that, we had the opportunity to have Ornette and Primetime open for the dead uh, at their Mardi Gras show at the Oakland Coliseum. Um, and that was, you know, that was beyond thrilling. Then Ornette sat in with the dead in the second half, which was, you know, only a 21 year dream of mine being <laughs> fulfilled. You know? I so, want to ask you who, who are some of the people that sat in from the jazz world or other that we'd be really interested to hear with the dead? Uh, David Murray a couple of times at the garden, right? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, at the garden once and once in Oakland. Um, and, uh, David also had a whole separate relationship with Bob Weir. They, they worked on some projects together. Um, you know, maybe the most successful one, well, the one that became certainly the most popular with, with, with the dead fans, uh, Branford Marsalis fit them like a glove. You know, Branford sat in, uh, most famously his first time, March 29th, 1990, he met them on stage. There was no pre, you know, uh, someone, some, again, a mutual friend of the band said, yeah, hey, you know, I could invite Bradford down to, to hang with you guys. And uh, this was before, he, I think this, yeah, before he was like the music director on The Tonight Show or anything like that. He was before just like Sting a, or after Sting? After Sting, yeah. yeah. So he was a known quantity in the rock world somewhat, but... Uh, um, and he just showed up and Brantford has one of those musical minds where he, he just hears what you're playing and he sounds like he's been working the tune, you know, he's, he's been deep into the book. He can like play back what someone else played, harmonize it, you know? Um, so by a couple of tunes into this, it was love, you know, he wound up sitting in with the dead, I think a total of four or five times over the years. So that was a really successful one. Uh, I always loved it when I airto, you know, uh, and sometimes Flora would do vocalizing too during the drum stuff. Um, yeah, there were a lot. Baba Olatunji was an incredible force of nature collaborator with them. Uh, you know, and then they'd have more conventional people from the blues and rock world. I'm not convention, wonderful people, Bonnie Raitt, you know, would sit in or someone like that, you know? So I, I, I loved a lot of, a lot of the guest people they had with them. Uh, wonderful, amazing, uh, uh, talking drum player named uh, Sikiru Adepoju, who came out of Baba, Baba Olatunji's group and uh, became still a close collaborator with Mickey Hart, um, master of the talking drum. Fantastic. Yeah, Mickey's world percussion thing has been so great. Yeah. It's, it's so important, I think, to, you know, have people like Zakir reaching a wider audience yes. and, and all that stuff that they do. And, and as a percussionist, it just, you know, I came up with seeing Ala Raka with, yeah. with Ravi Shankar when I was a little kid. So, I mean, world music percussion was something that fired my imagination. And right. so we always were real into the fact that the dead had two drummers and that they did a lot of percussion. Uh, that was always a, 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 a really nice feature of the music. And, and the fact that, uh, you know, Mickey's done a lot of world fusion. Done a lot of world fusion and also became a preservationist of historical recordings of world music and an advocate for the preservation of the indigenous cultures whose music is threatened by industrial encroachment and political upheaval and all that stuff. He, yeah, he's, uh, he, he's a, a real force in all that. And, you know, he's testified before Congress about, you know, the rainforests, you know, and, and if you think about that only as an environmental issue, it's a huge cultural issue too, because the people who create that art, and that music, you know, are driven from their homes and the oral history goes away. So, yeah, that, that's, that's a, an amazing story there. So, so anyway, so, so yeah, Jerry and Ornette just became incredible soul brothers who unfortunately did not get to work together as, as often as, as we would have liked, but, uh, but I'm so glad that happened, you know, and they had, they had, so they had a great love for each other and we're still, you know, we're still in touch with, we were in touch with Ornette right up until he passed, uh, at one at one of my <laughs> one of my and Ornette's joint birthday parties at the loft, uh, it happened to be on a night when uh, one of the post dead bands, uh, Further, which was Phil and Bob and some a bunch of cool younger musicians, uh, they had a night off in New York. So uh, but Phil couldn't make it; he had a previous engagement. But Bobby and several other members of the band came to the loft and and had a hang with Ornette, which was which was just lovely. So. Uh, I have very fond memories of that. Uh, I have an amusing way after the fact uh, 
Ornette story uh, involving involving the dead. Um, Bill Kreutzmann, one of the two drummers, for those who don't know, um, published a memoir um, a few years ago. I can't maybe 2015, 2014, somewhere in there. And at one point he wrote about how he had learned never to let praise go to his head um, because, and the example he gave was um, when Bradford Marsalis had played with the dead, he talked about what good listeners they were, how they really listened to each other and how they listened to their guest musicians. Or, um, and Bill thought, oh man, that would just put me on the top of the world. And then Ornette came to sit in with the dead a second time. This was not the show that he opened for them. This was, he happened to be in LA at the same time the dead were. So he came to a show at the L.A. Sports Arena and sat in for a little bit. And Bill writes in the memoir that after he came off stage, the Dead's manager, Cameron Sears, said to him, you know, I was talking to Arnett and he said, he said, you guys sound like you weren't even listening to each other. And Bill was really brought down by this. You know, he was really bummed. This is like 1994 when this happened. And, and I, re, I read him writing about it in the memoir in 2015. And, and Bill just said, well, that, that just showed me that, you know, Bradford's praise, you know, I shouldn't take that to heart, you know, because it really bummed me that Ornette said that. But when, I, but when I read that, I said, you know what? I don't think Ornette was saying what Cameron thought he was saying or what Cameron conveyed to Bill. Because I remember Ornette saying to me once, and it may have even been the night the dead were, he was at the Garden for the Dead. Ornette once said to me, you know, if you really know each other well, you don't have to listen to each other. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. a part of harmelotics too, is the contrapuntal nature. Right. The independent nature of each of the musicians. Right. Get that in full color in prime time. Right, and, and I, once, I once had a longer conversation about the idea of listening with Ornette. And he said... He said, you see, if you, if you listen to something and then, and then respond to it, you're reacting to a moment that already happened. <laughs> so his idea was that people should try to get to the next moment, you know, in their own way. And he said, if you arrive there together, that's beautiful. And if you don't arrive there together, that's beautiful. You yeah. Know? Ornette was hearing, you know, multiple strands clearly. Right. You know, that's laced throughout all of his music. You have the, that notion. Right. So he was so he wasn't counseling against listening. What, right. he was, what he was saying that was when you're really attuned, when you're really empathetic, when you have the powers of anticipation, listening happens. You know, it's, it's just a function of being conscious. So, you know, it, it was just a different way to talk about listening. So the next time I saw Bill Kreutzmann, he was playing with Dead and Company at the Garden, back home at the Garden. And I went, I, I went backstage to say hello. It was the first time I'd seen him since I read his book. And I said, you know, Billy, that thing in your book about Ornette? And I said, I, I, I don't think he was saying anything negative. I think that was a compliment. And I explained the context and what Ornette had said about this. And Bill, this is like, he wrote the book like 20, 21 years later after he got bummed out by Ornette's comment. And he said, oh my God, that makes so much more sense. He said, I feel so much better now. <laughs> so... It this, doesn't you, sound like you were tied to listening to the other guy the whole time. Right, right. right. So, you know, he was he was so relieved and like just felt so vindicated. It was beautiful to be able to tell him that. <laughs> oh, man, that's so great. Yeah. Well, man, this this has been such a blast talking to you about this stuff. Absolutely. You know, I not only can talk about it forever, I feel like I have been talking about it forever since, since 1968. <laughs> as far as the dead go, you know, uh, and also just talking about free music, talking about what people like Ornette and Cecil have given the world is like, you know, it's enriched my life so much and sharing it with other people is just such a blast. I'm so glad you're doing it here too. Yeah, man. And, and, uh, I'll tell you another little Ornette moment that I know you will appreciate, uh, when he hired me to play timpani, in his harmonic chamber players mm -hmm. 2000 we had rehearsals we had a gig at battery park jazz festival on the evening with his sultan khan his uh, indian project with badal oh, yeah. and donardo and yeah. his trio with billy and charlie hayden wow and then the chamber piece so 
here's the first rehearsal. We have music put on our music stands when we show up and we're all getting set up and it's everybody's getting their instruments out. We're all getting set up. Ornette is chit chatting with the musicians. He's friendly, getting everybody comfortable, you know, and he comes up to me and he looks at me, he says hello. And then he looks at the music on my stand, which by the way is basically bum, 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 bum. And I'm looking at him like, okay, this is interesting. And it's a piece called La Statue, which was a piece he wrote for the, the uh, Statue of Liberty to commemoration. And he looks at me, he looks at the music, and he looks at me and he says, I don't want you to play any of that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I, you know, I'm like poker face, you know, and, he, and I go, oh, and he says, I want you to do your own thing. And I was let to do my own thing for the entire piece. That's beautiful. Uh, and 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 this is where, you know, coming into Ornette's music, I knew that the two bass player concept was in play. So he had an acoustic classical bass player. Right. And I was the timpanist, so I thought of myself as the second bass player. Sure. So I was doing like double stops and different sorts of rhythmic stuff to interact with the bass player. And the only other person who was improvising in the ensemble, because it was all classical, largely classical players, was Lou Soloff. Wow. Lou Soloff was the trumpet guy on this gig and he played amazing. Yeah. And everybody, it was funny because like, like primetime often did, as you will know, everybody had to do an unaccompanied solo. Yeah. And it would go around <laughs> to the different people playing unaccompanied solos. And I ne I've never seen anybody else do that. So it was kind of funny because classical people had to solo. And in 2000, that was a lot less common than it is now. Sure. I, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that was that was a fun experience. And then we recorded uh, after the gig uh, and Gary Giddens, I remember, was there and, and he was... Uh, someone that supported me when I was in Cecil's band and, and, and thought, you know, oh, it's what he's doing is interesting. And, and so I got to talk to Gary and Donardo and I also recorded duets around that time. Oh man. So, so here's the question for Ornette enthusiasts and, and, and historians, where are those recordings of the La Statue and where are the recordings of uh, me and Donardo? I have to ask Donardo. Yeah. But certainly, um, the disposition of those tapes, it's an interesting piece because I was always inspired by Ornette's connection to classical music. Yes. In high school, we had Skies of America. We had uh, Poets and Painters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that record with, with the different chamber pieces? Mm -hmm. It's very inspiring. Here's a guy. He's he's going to do that in addition to everything he's done for jazz. Right, and yeah, you know, and, and then and then you know, his deep connection to like Texas R and B, you know, and like everything and, and and gospel and everything. I mean, just yeah, it's it's uh, he he was such. I mean, just sitting and talking to Ornette was like you know, yeah. so, some of the most revelatory stuff that ever happened to me you know people found ornette cryptic when he talked because he, he didn't, didn't talk in very lim linear terms but i never had a problem understanding what he was no, saying you could you could definitely sense what he was talking about yeah, yeah but i don't know if on paper i had the same experience with wayne shorter uh-huh oh yeah wayne yeah wayne is wayne is not a linear speaker but yeah. Oh. But on paper, it doesn't come across the way it comes across when he's speaking to you. Right, right. Because the inflection matter and seeing, looking into his eyes matter. You know, all that all that stuff connects. It's the same thing we said about them musically, like wanting to engage all the senses. It's true. It's true verbally as well. You know, and that thing, you know, that misconception that Ornette was being negative when he talked about not listening to each other. You know, that you could take it that way. But knowing Ornette, I took it the other way. Yeah, and I remember the albums that had his notation system in the liner notes. We would study yeah, that stuff. Yeah. yeah, all of and his writings about music that would show up. Yeah. I'd always wish that there would have been a, a harmonic manifesto, but I don't yeah. know it materialized. Yeah, it's probably it probably exists in some form somewhere, but not, you know. <laughs> 
I, 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 wa I wonder if the people who would consider publishing it would consider it comprehensible. I don't know. Right. Well, that's the thing. And, and, um, but he was, he was a communicator and, and I like that a lot about Ornette. I, I had nice conversations with him about Dolphy and Jimmy yeah. Lyons, yeah. uh, diff, you know, cause I wanted to know if the alto players, you know, that, that he was into or that were contemporaneous with him. Yeah. And then he did a wonderful thing for, for me, which was, I was talking to my dad after sound check and he came off of the stage and Ornette walked like 50 yards to come over to me and my dad. And he went right up to my dad and he shook his hand and he said, I want you to know your son's very talented. I really enjoyed working with him. Oh, that's so sweet. And we were, and my dad looked at me, I looked at my dad and we were like, whoa, you yeah. know, it was, it was yeah. so heavy that, that he had made the effort to do that. And I'll never forget that incredible moment. And, and yeah. he was that kind of guy. Now his, his generosity to me was just extraordinary. Yeah. Miss him every day. Yeah. I, and I'm always listening to his music and different aspects of his music. A lot of the, you know, the, the, the quartet with Blackwell was something that meant a lot to me in the eighties. I had this recurring experience where I would go to see Ornette with the quartet with Billy Higgins and Billy Higgins wouldn't be there and it would be Blackwell. Right. Right. And so I got to see Blackwell in all these different situations where I was never going to see him, including one time asleep on the subway. <laughs> one time I got on the A train and he was there. I said, that's not because he was a big guy, you know? Yeah. And I just loved his patterns and, and his touch on the drums. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, I love what, I love what Billy did with that music. But for me, Blackwell, man. Yeah, he was amazing. And you know that record, um, Ornette, where it's Scott LaFaro on bass? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. I mean, that's a cool record. Yeah. I mean, LaFaro is a whole other chapter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, Char you know, getting to see him with Charlie as many times as I yeah. did was so wonderful. It, it really was. Uh, and these guys are no longer with us, but we still love their music and, and it'll go on forever. Yeah. <laughs> well sir i appreciate you taking the time it's really been a blast hey man a, a lot of territory covered and yeah there could be more chapters to to come <laughs> as far as i'm concerned well, we did okay all right man thank all you right. so everybody thank you for listening my guest has been gary lambert and we're talking about some of the masters today sending out a lot of love to to cecil and ornette in memory of them and uh and Jerry <laughs> and Jerry and all the guys that we've been been losing recently who have been so important to the music and you know the oral history project goes on and, and trying to catch as many of these stories as we can of these gentlemen uh, do do look up my work on uh, on the Yale oral history I've done over a hundred of, of these interviews with with some of the masters and just being able to get, you know, Sonny Rollins to talk about his work and Henry Threadgill to talk yeah. about his work. And and uh, and these guys are so important to creative music and, and their music and their words, because we want to try to, you know, find out how they're thinking about this stuff, too. Yes. You know, a lot of times they don't get to write that autobiography. So it's important to be able to chat with them and to be able to chat with you, Gary Lambert. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Thanks, Greg.